Um, first, I want to thank the FreeBSD Foundation, NetApp, everybody for uh, allowing us to present on our solution. I'm really looking forward to talking about how we're using um, FreeBSD in several different areas within our, our product line. Um, this Today, we'll be focused very much on our rural broadband solution. Um, so I'll go over that in a little bit of detail here and what we've been doing. A lot of exciting stuff when it comes to FreeBSD. Um, we've been working on this for close to what? six years now. And through that process, many, many di different iterations of uh, implementation of the technology. And um, as a result, we've kind of, I think, perfected it to the extent that we're now taking the footprint and we're starting to replicate it across different areas within very, what we consider very hard to reach rural areas. And notoriously, what we found as we've kind of moved through this is um, most of these customers that are in these areas have been very constrained by your typical, you know, you see hot spots that are very, you know, they have very limited amounts of bandwidth, you know, they're capped. Um, Starlink doesn't necessarily work in a lot of these areas because there's a significant amount of tree cover. Um, so we've come up with very creative ways to essentially get the technology into these spots and um, provide a level of rural internet access. So as we look at it, um, there's, there's a few things I wanted to cover about, you know, kind of what it is. Um, really, the, the biggest push for us when I moved into the Blue Ridge area was there wasn't a, a good solution for internet access in general. You know, we are, we are usually constrained by uh, like a dish network type scenario, which works, but there's high latencies associated with that. It's very hard to do remote work in those situations. And what I found is um, we weren't necessarily wanting to build a business out of this. What we wanted to do is we wanted to help the community. So, you know, remote education, kids being able to, to go to, to do remote school during COVID, which was really what kind of drove this is the whole COVID thing. And provide a level of quality of service that wasn't constrained with, like I said, these caps. Um, a couple things that I, you know, I didn't like when I worked, when I worked on uh, networks up there uh, specifically were um, I found the quality of service to be very poor. Um, so even if you had high bandwidth, you had supposed good latencies, there was always uh, significant issues with, um, you know, drops. Uh, you wouldn't get good streaming, consistent streaming performance. So that really put me on a mission to fix it. And that's really where, through my experience with FreeBSD, which I've been using since, gosh, uh, 2008, um, I just found it to be... Um, the best overall solution because of the network performance and the simplicity and everything else that was relatively um, just easy to use with it in general. Um, so, and the other reason I, I kind of did this too is I, I was told it couldn't be done and I don't like it when people tell me things can't be done, so I was gonna find a way to do it. Um, so some of the challenges, pretty, some are pretty apparent, you know, when you work up in the Blue Ridge uh, or any mountain range for that matter, is there's a lot of, um, very unfriendly terrain. Uh, there's uh, uh, trees, there's um, obstructions, uh, power is very difficult to get in some of these locations. So you might not necessarily be able to get a connection to the household directly. You have to bring it up to the edge of the, the, uh, the tree line and then you have to get it back from the tree line over into the house and that requires some very specialized uh, wireless gear. And as I mentioned before, Starlink wasn't necessarily an option for a lot of the folks because just because there were so many trees and the obstructions were pretty significant in those areas. So what does the footprint look like? This kind of gives you guys an idea. It's, it's a fairly large area of the Blue Ridge outside of Washington, D.C. So if you head uh, west towards Winchester um, and go over the mountain there, <clears throat> that's the range that we effectively service. And there's a small town called Berryville there. And what we ended up doing is we were able to get a full gig symmetric fiber <coughs> brought into Berryville. And then we basically beam that up the mountain. Um, it's about six to seven miles there into multiple points of presence. And then those points of presence then um, beam that access essentially down to the customers or we do it through uh, direct fiber trenching. So we, we actually trench our own fiber and we connect the homes through fiber to home as well. But where FreeBSD comes into this is what we ended up doing is the point of presence where the fiber comes in, instead of using your traditional Cisco or whatever router, we actually use FreeBSD. We use layer three capabilities in that. We use a product called Bird for that. So we can run BGP, we can run OSPF, we can run a bunch of different things that um, you would see on those enterprise grade routers. And we just didn't feel that um, there was a need. And we proved that. Uh, we could do everything in FreeBSD. It did it very, very well. And beyond that, we extended the FreeBSD um, 
functionality up into the, what we call the CP, their customer premise equipment. So as it connects to the customer house or it connects to what we call a remote pop on the top of the mountain, um, that would have its own free BSD router footprint. <laughs> and then that would provide the access uh, backhaul into the, um, the neighborhoods and the communities specifically. And as you can see in the picture on the left-hand side, some of it was pretty difficult. We had to get up on top of a few buildings and we ran some, um, some 11 gigahertz radios to be able to provide that bandwidth across um, those buildings and up to the mountain. So one of the things I wanted to focus on here is how, how do we keep it cost effective? Um, and the great thing about FreeBSD, because as nimble as it is, we were able to put these, uh, most of these routing platforms into a very simple Celeron J-Series type platform. Um, eight gigs of memory, nothing special there. Um, M.2 footprints, so you get really high speed storage performance on those. And then we coupled that with um, MicroTik uh, switches, which are relatively inexpensive. They push packets pretty well. And then for monitoring and observability, um, instead of going the typical route with Linux, we built all that functionality into FreeBSD. So we've got Grafana, Telegraph, Prometheus. We built our own um, node exporter plugins so we can monitor um, traffic going across Starlink. Links is an example, and I'll go into that in a minute. So we do gRPC monitoring. We built in our own um, plugins for that. And then the other piece is we wanted to make sure that we provided um, robust and secure VPN solutions for customers if they wanted to use that. So we integrated WireGuard, OpenVPN, open and your traditional IPsec solutions there. So how does it come together? This is a quick, um, and I'm sorry, that's not the largest picture. I tried to kind of cram it in here. Um, but this gives you an idea of what we effectively built. So um, at the very bottom there, we've got three uh, essentially Nook-sized motherboards. Those run those uh, Celeron J-Series processors, like I mentioned, eight gigs of RAM each. They all have free BSD on them. There's a management node, and we run PF with CARP. And that provides a level of redundancy. And you can see right above that, what we ended up doing is um, we stitched that into um, a LTE booster up in the left-hand corner there. You'll see it kind of right on the top. And then what we did is we backfed the whole solution with a 100 AH battery. Um, and uh, then provided the network bandwidth and functionality through, as I'm on the right-hand side, you'll see there um, a backhaul where it's a 60 gigahertz backhaul. That's to your traditional fixed wireless that would connect to long haul into a customer site. And then the fiber, also connectivity in there. And then lastly, the cellular connectivity, which is probably the most compelling and interesting part about the FreeBSD work that we've been doing. And I wanted to thank uh, Clara for some of that work as well, because they did um, help us with the driver for the Quectel modems. Um, and really, the objective was for a customer that, regardless of their connection need, if, they, if it's fiber, if it's wireless, or it's cellular, we wanted to tailor a solution that meets that specific need. And we also wanted some failover capabilities built into that. So we built a solution to kind of come uh, to, to address all those, those needs. Now beyond that, we also wanted to make sure there was a significant amount of power resilience there. So we did couple the FreeBSD routers with uh, the solution that you see here. Um, and it uses um, a very simple kind of inverter. We use a, you see up in the upper um, left-hand corner, a smart shunt so we can actually monitor through Bluetooth and also through network, the uh, power consumption um, on the uh, solution. And then we also um, wired series batteries so you would have a significant amount of power backup in the event there was a power failure. And what we ended up doing is at the top of the mountain, you'd have a small box, the FreeBSD router goes in there, and then this infrastructure goes into another box, and then that provides the, uh, the battery backup capability for customers up at the top of the mountain. So if we look at the remote edge, this is more on the customer side. There was a couple requirements that we had here. Um, we wanted to get the, the, the FreeBSD routers into an IP65 kind of waterproof box or water resistant box. A lot of these things mount on a pole on the outside. And in order for us to ensure that um, those are resilient, we uh, put it into, like I said, IP65 box. And then we built in a battery backup solution in there. And we also built in um, a remote wireless solution into that as well. And then at the bottom, you'll see there's a smaller router that actually goes into the home um, that has FreeBSD on it as well. 
um, and that's now 14.1 um, as of the latest release. And um, we, the, these are the routers that we effectively place on, on the customer side. So if we look under the hood a little bit, um, a couple interesting things here is um, one of the things was the board itself. In order to provide all the connectivity that we wanted, um, the board had to be pretty robust from a connectivity option. So um, what we ended up doing is through Quicktel and CR Wireless, which are the two kind of big uh, modem providers, there's an M.2 slot. And on that, the modem plugs into that. And then through FreeBSD, we use the MP, MPD5 or we use the PPP dialer to effectively bring that functionality up through your standard SIMs. So with this solution, it's kind of nice because a customer can use T-Mobile, they can use AT&T, they can use any specific um, cellular provider with the FreeBSD router and um, that works natively within that platform. The SIM installs in there, the, the uh, modem connects in there and everything's pretty much um, consolidated into that one four by four nook footprint. Um, and then we have other things in the box, like there's a PoE switch. So if we need to backhaul a wireless unit or we have to um, install a fiber switch in there or something like that, we can use PoE, which is power over ethernet, and we can plug that in and then that powers those devices. So we don't have to have additional power requirements to be able to do that. So with Starlink, this is an interesting one because um, we had one customer that was um, not really liking some of the quality of service that they were dealing with. So I was like, you know, what if we take the FreeBSD router that we built with some of the optimizations around dummy net and PF and everything else and put it in front of Starlink? And they allow you to do that. You can run a Starlink router in router mode or you can run it in uh, essentially what they call pass-through mode. And then that requires you to put your own layer three or router device on there. So that's exactly what we did. And this customer was very much into live broadcasting, 4K, 8K streams. And what they're finding is, you know, they're kind of getting fragmentation on, on some of the streams. So we put that in there, we implemented that, we added some dummy net um, packet policing on it. And that ended up solving most of the problems they had with the, the, the traffic optimization. So that turned out really, really well. Now, the other challenge we had was the setup was on a remote side of the property. So we also had to bring up uh, the solution with a solar system. So part of what we're doing with the FreeBSD routers in some of these very remote, uh, remote areas is we're using a 48 volt solar setup with batteries. And then it, you can see in the upper right hand corner, that's um, a company called Boondocker out of Canada that makes um, a basically a AC to DC converter. Uh, so you can run Starlink over your standard DC connections. It's very efficient, but that allows us to put it in the box and power the Starlink from that device. So what we basically built here is a solar system, completely battery backup with the DC conversion works with Starlink, and now you can um, use um, our Photon product with the Starlink. And all the observability, like I mentioned, with gRPC and Grafana, we've got hooks into um, Starlink's API, so we can monitor drops, we can monitor packet performance and throughput. And typically with uh, most of the LEOs, the low uh, orbit satellites, is um, you, have, you have little um, drops that happen every now and then. You know, they're very small, might be a second or two. But a lot of customers want to be able to track that from an SLA standpoint. There we go. Um, they want to track that from an SLA standpoint. So we did add a observability dashboard that allows them to do that and, and track that significantly. Um, the last one here, as I mentioned, and this is the, probably the most popular use case we have for the FreeBSD implementation is through standard cellular network, right? So, Couple elements here when we implemented a router is these areas are very hard to reach, so we need higher power boosters to be able to get the typical AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon signals into the router and make sure that um, it's very strong and the performance is good. So as a result, what we ended up doing, we used CellFi on the right-hand side that boosts the signal coming in from two LDPA antennas, and then that um, effectively connects directly into that nook size board that uh, cellular router, and that boosts that cellular signal to the extent customers can use it for standard data connections and whatever they want. You know, um, streaming, um, remote work works incredibly, incredibly well. 
The main problem, of course, with these is that you're still constrained to the ISP plans, and there are plans that have higher um, limitations in terms of bandwidth, but it's, uh, it's a good solution for customers that only have a cellular option where they're at, and they want um, good performance. So um, a lot of optimizations. Um, some of this is pretty straightforward. Um, we use, uh, like I said, Sierra Wireless Quectel modems. The Quectel on the right-hand side is nice because it um, has uh, several optimizations that allow it to use the newer bands with the cellular providers. Okay, so with the bands, when you look at those, you'll typically see on the very bottom there, 2, 4, 5, 12. Those are all very standard bands um, that provide okay bandwidth. Um, some of them have different um, s different uh, spec frequencies on the spectrum. So when you look at that, the lower the frequency on the spectrum, the more that's going to um, go through things like obstacles like trees and, and uh, walls and homes. You get higher up in the spectrum, it gets more difficult. And that's where 5G NR and some of the newer stuff that runs very high on the spectrum, um, you need small cells. So you'll see these, these kind of like cellular cells that are built all over the place so they can communicate with one another. And um, the newer modems that effectively support that. So with band 66 and band 72, those are rule bands. Those are lower on the frequency, and those are usually what a lot of customers use as they um, have very rural connections. So that modem um, allows that functionality, and we added it in. A um, little bit on the dialer config, very straightforward. The only thing we really have to change on this as we move from provider to provider is if you look at the very bottom there, you see that um, our ISPSN, that is a, a effectively the identifier you would change. Each provider has that. It's a very simple change. And then they can bring the, the carrier up on the FreeBSD router and start to use it effectively. So what we did is um, we also wanted to make sure the packet policing piece was there. So there's um, conditioning on the traffic. And that comes in a couple different ways. There's a bunch of sys controls that we ran um, to be able to condition some things. And then there's also dummy net, which is, is, is fantastic for setting very specific um, limitations on bandwidth. And you can also pair that with things like FQ Codal to further optimize the traffic and provide a si significant amount of packet throughput, but also packet policing. Um, and then uh, adding that into FreeBSD is very easy through the rc.conf. As you can see, it's a few lines. We run PF with that. We run um, dummy net right there, and you can see there's IPFW that's run as well, which I know um, uh, dummy net is now part of kind of like the main line, so we're planning on moving it from that soon. But that tends to work, and this is the solution that we um, came up with on the cellular side. Works incredibly well. The, re the reliability is through the roof, like it's um, very rarely goes down. Um, and what I find is if you look at OpenBSD and some of the other BSDs, they all have PPP. They also use a technology called MBIM or QMI, which is a newer way to uh, automate these modems and communicate with these modems. And it tends to be pretty good, but it's also problematic. And if you really want to go back to the stability and just absolute 100% stability, the PPP dialer is really a nice way to do that, and it provides a significant amount of throughput. In most cases, customers are getting 150 megs down at a minimum on the modem. Uh, or I'm sorry, one gig down on the modem and then 150 megs up. So for most people, that's perfectly fine. You get a ton of bandwidth. So a dummy net, uh, it's just a quick example here. So kind of for the, the more geeky folks, um, it does, sh it does, there's some options in here that you can set. Again, very easy. You set your pipes, your queues, and your scheduler. And then you'll notice there in the scheduler, you have the FQ codal um, for some of the packet conditioning. And then you can set your flow uh, characteristics as well. Uh, very configurable um, and uh, customizable. And uh, setting bandwidth restrictions limitations is literally two lines within that, um, that configuration. And we have a script that automates that. So how do we actually deploy this? Um, so this is a huge challenge in these areas. You know, Obviously, they're hard to get to. You don't want to go into these things repeatedly all the time. But you do want some way to fully automate that. So we have a separate product that we call Mojo. It's a bare metal provisioning platform. It's built for data centers. And we just added FreeBSD 14.1 support for that. So you can actually go in. You can bring Mojo up. 
And when you do uh, that, you can deploy a FreeBSD operating system on any Redfish compliant asset, which means um, typical server, Dell, HPE, Supermicro, all of them have that, B it's called a baseboard management port, and that allows you to essentially install an operating system directly onto that node through REST, through secure REST. So as we built that out, we added our Photon platform in there, and that allows remote deployment, um, and it allows remote management of that node as well. So what we've effectively built out is um, a bare metal provisioning solution that does indeed manage the Photon stack so we don't have to go to the systems directly all of the time. A um, little bit under the hood there, you can see uh, on the uh, lower left-hand side, um, that all is FreeBSD as well. So we have two products there, and we've been moving our bare metal provisioning stack over to FreeBSD um, and using all the functionality that has to do with you know, PF um, and then uh, everything else that BSD has to offer. The only thing that we are working on right now that we don't have on that is the OCI compliant container ecosystem. And um, that's, that's come along really nicely with Podman, and we anticipate we're gonna be able to move um, our Docker services into that fairly shortly, which is pretty exciting uh, for everybody and that's been waiting for that. Um, monitoring, so as, as I go through that, um, that uh, architecture, one of the important things I wanted to build the monitoring uh, solution together. We had the options, we could use a Zabbix or one of the big ones. Um, instead, we decided to build that from scratch and BSD turned out to be a great system for that. It supports all the packages out of the box. You know, we were able to install Grafana, all the plugins, Prometheus for the real time, and then um, Telegraph is, the, is one of the uh, uh, packages we use for the actual data ingestion, and that pulls it into the real-time database. Very easy, not much configuration. This thing comes up in about 10 minutes to full functionality. And as you can see, we can build very robust dashboards that provide a ton of detail for our wireless network. So for us, it's important because we want to track weather, because um, we want to see what's coming in and out. Allows us to prepare if we need to scale something up or down. And then we also, of course, want to monitor system health, but beyond that, we want to monitor things like radio statistics. You know, like what does our RSSI look like? You know, what is our signal strengths? What does the signal scatter looks like? And all of that functionality we've been able to use and put into the platform with FreeBSD without any issues whatsoever. In fact, it's so reliable that we uh, now have a system up on the Blue Ridge that has been up for two years um, without any problems whatsoever. It gets security updates, um, but yeah, it's just incredibly reliable. And it's a beautiful system, and the customers uh, comment all the time on it and mention how reliable it is consistently in, in comparison to the other systems they were using previously. So we're very, very thankful for that. And then this dashboard just shows some of the, um, what we consider the uh, customer side stuff. The other one was the server side. And this tracks um, the signal strengths on the customer side so we can correlate those. And we can fix any problems before they become a major problem for the customer. Um, so what did we see here? You know, this is all, of course, results-driven stuff. Um, what did it add for us? What, what did it bring to the customers? And the results were actually pretty astounding. Um, in its most basic form, I mean, we were seeing pretty much buffer bloat-free connections. Um, and for those that don't um, deal with buffer bloat all the time, it's essentially when you have uh, the packet buffers and the cards um, are filling up and the system can't effectively deal with it properly, so it basically drops packets or it causes problems of congestion, right? So um, what we did with DummyNet and through FQ Codal fix buffer bloat. And most of these tests that customers run, and they do it very often, is um, they're seeing buffer bloat grades on waveform that are usually an A and an A plus, which is relatively hard to do in a very consistent manner. And if you look at a lot of the other ISPs, it's kind of hit and miss, you know. Ours is very consistent, and we see performance that is just always great. Um, and in the lower right-hand corner there, you'll see um, some of the uh, tests that we did through the FreeBSD router with the upload performance, download performance, and then um, the browser and streaming test. Uh, it's called nperf, so if you guys uh, have already used that, I would definitely recommend that for your home tests. It's fantastic because it does streaming tests and gives you a good idea of what your actual performance and your jitter and everything looks like in your connection. Um, and then lastly on this slide, on the lower left-hand side there, um, the 
we call it mountain link, and you can see in comparison there, the speeds, are, it's relatively small, but um, 1.2 gigs at the top of our main pop, and then I think the highest bandwidth one is Starlink at 220. So we're doing really, really well in that regard. And um, what we ended up doing with this entire network is instead of carving very specific download and upload requirements for the customers, you know, like, hey, you get 10 megs down, 5 megs up, we open that entire gig pipe up. And we have enough confidence that FreeBSD is doing a great job with the packet policing and um, just conditioning and everything else that um, we can do that reliably and we don't, have to, we don't have to set hard caps or limits. So for customers, that's been great because if they're the only one in the network at you know, um, 12 o'clock in the morning, they're flexing into the gig speeds and they're not having to deal with the pain of those, those capped um, connections. So the other thing that we uh, very much focused on and I thought was very absent in a lot of the solutions or not simple enough is the uh, security posture and the reporting capability in the system. So there's two requirements we had. One is we don't want to see what the customer's traffic is. It's not our business and that's our model is we want to make sure that when customers use our product, they um, can set up their own tunnels. We, you know, they can set up tunnels through our router, but the, the bottom line is we don't want to look at their stuff and we don't think we should. Um, so we set up reports that give them an idea of just basic things without looking at their actual traffic, their actual data, you know, how much is flowing across the wire. So they can see through VNS stat, they can see reports daily like, hey, you know, at 12 o'clock in the morning, my son used, um, you know, five gigs, right? So that's been really helpful for families because they can get an idea of what's being used, when it's being used, and how much is being used. And then um, it generates the report you see there on the right, which gives them an idea of, it does a daily speed test um, and gives them just an idea of what their overall performance looks like there. So uh, kind of a collage there of uh, various projects we've had. You can see there's some, there's some dark fiber that we've run up in the upper left-hand corner. Um, gives you an idea of the terrain. Um, yeah, climbing up the tower, that was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> and then uh, you know some of the work we did on top of the buildings with some of the other radios. And if anybody is into point-to-point uh, uh, -point wireless and they, they kind of want to know what we're using there, we're very heavy into MicroTik for the wireless, uh, and then we use Mimosa for the um, long haul links. That's the six to seven, uh, seven mile links. And then we also use a bunch of Ubiquiti gear as well, but we definitely have preference on Mimosa because of the stability of the gear itself. So what have we learned when uh, using BSD? And this is cumulative over the years. This is not my first experience using BSD. Um, I've used it in healthcare environments. I've used it in the government. I've used it pretty much in every vertical, and it's always my go-to operating system uh, because of its stability and its simplicity repeatedly. Um, it's not the latest, greatest thing. It's focused on um, what works best for the customer and how can you start at a simple footprint and then potentially build up to something you need without throwing in every single thing that the customer really doesn't need at all. Um, and also the ports, uh, packages and ports. That's a big one. Uh, it's very rare I have any problems with that. And if you use YUM or DNF, or you're familiar with those uh, package management systems, you, you literally want to jump off a cliff at a certain period of time. So um, packages has just been really good um, to be able to deploy free BSD software. Um, great observability. And then the other thing I want to mention is the community. Um, it, it, Ever since I've been using it, the support has always been there. People have always been friendly. Um, the amount of knowledge and information that comes in from the community is absolutely incredible. Um, and the documentation is solid. Like, and that is one thing when you're dealing with Linux distributions, you're literally clawing for documentation or you're going into you know, Reddit or whatever with VSD, you can go in, you can see complete documentation trail and you can start to work from that, which is fantastic. And then the other one I like is the fact that I can minimize the kernel. I can go in, I can, I, can, uh, I can edit the kernel very simply, and then I can go in and I can recompile that kernel, and next thing you know, I have only the drivers I need, and I only have the things that I need for the system to operate at a very minimal level in a matter of minutes. 
So that's a huge one. Um, and I think as we, as we continue to grow it out and we look at like the roadmap, um, there's a few things that we're particularly interested in. We want to continue to expand the rural footprint. We want to continue to help families. Um, we want to um, prototype this in a way that it's available to the community. So we're going to post all of our designs so people can go in. They can build these kits. They can build these units if they'd like um, and customize them to the way that they feel would work best within their environments. Um, and then continue the support on the new 5G technologies from the carriers. So we're going we're gonna to be working on new drivers, new support for new modems uh, coming up, which is pretty exciting. And then we also want to add in additional um, support for the newer platforms. So ARM is one, which has been emerging within the BSD community, low power, a lot of efficiencies to use in that platform. Um, and we want to start to leverage that as well. So we'll be working with ARM and uh, continuing to expand that. And then lastly, um, we want to continue to expand our Mojo product, which is the data center provisioning product to get FreeBSD deeper into the data center. Um, huge focus of ours, and we're getting a lot of interest from that, from, from people and customers. They're like, oh my gosh, so you can actually go in, you can go into one pane of glass, you can select FreeBSD, and you can hit deploy, and it's going to deploy FreeBSD, zero touch, through Mojo to any bare metal uh, Redfish-enabled asset. So that's, that's absolutely huge, and it really helps accelerate things from the FreeBSD perspective in the enterprise. Um, so I think that's all I really have. Any questions? Alan? Let's go. So how are you managing uh, upgrading those appliances once they're already in the field? Like you mentioned switching from 13.2 to 14.1. We have a scripted process that we have that we use through um, through Mojo. So um, we do the you know the typical free BSD update. It's been relatively problem free, um, and that yeah that tends to work pretty well. No, so um, there's, okay, so this is, this is actually a really good question. Um, yeah, the, so he was asking about um, the fact that the, um, the systems themselves don't have BMCs in them, so how can we deploy and get to them without the BMC, right? And that is, it's a complex thing, because um, with Redfish, you, you can simply connect to the BMC, and then you can deploy. Um, with systems like this, you either need vPro, which is a, it's, it's an Intel technology, that's in, in um, that's uh, built into the CPU that allows you to do some remote functionality and, and manageability with that. So it's kind of an older SOAP API, but it works, um, and that's really the way you know we do it. And then there's another one with AMD called Dash, and these are all this is another DMTF standard called Dash, and the requirement is you have a Realtek enabled NIC, and then you can connect to those nodes and you can do remote management through Dash, right? So there's options there. It's just it has to be vPro enabled. Otherwise, you wouldn't have that functionality. So the, the question was, do we uh, use the pre-built packages or do we have our own? Um, mostly the FreeBSD packages. Yeah, we don't, we don't do a ton, a ton of customization. The only areas where there would be some of that is around um, the node exporters. So for like Prometheus, you know, if we need to do gRPC communication with um, with the Starlink unit, that would be an area where we'd have our own. Yep. Um, and I honestly, I don't have a lot of problems with it. It works really, really well. And if we if we have any issues with a, a package, we can we can always use a port, and you use that. But we haven't had any issues running um, anything through package. Yeah. 
yeah, it's been great for everything we need right now, yeah. Um, so with FRR, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, so he asked if we were using BIRD out of what muscle memory yeah, or FRR um, and what, what is the feature comparison of that. Um, so there, there's two different scenarios that we have there that we're focused on. Um, one is there's situations where we use the standard you know, routing capability in BSD for, for you know, kind of lighter weight stuff. It doesn't require that. Um, we just find BIRD is lightweight and it's relatively easy to use. Um, FRR, so I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. It's, it's, it's kind of large <laughs> and complicated, right? Um, we have tried to use it, and we have used it with success, but um, we just divert back to what we feel is simple and, and, and super stable. Um, the other thing is uh, FRR, yeah, the community around the community around it too is is different, right? It just you know it just it it has its challenges. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. So we we have we have a scripted approach that we have, and I'll I'll be happy to share that with you. Yes. Yeah, so, no, so IPFW, the only reason that's in there is for the dummy net functionality, right? That's all it does, yeah. And then um, PF, it does what it's, firewall, yeah, exactly. So there's a few caveats there. I'm happy to discuss those off, off the, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it Took a little while to get it kind of to the point where it worked pretty well together, um, but I know there there's changes in that community in terms of how um, you know it's using mainline PF now, so that's one thing we're looking at. Any other questions? Uh, as far as cellular boost, you mean? Yeah, so the question was um, on the Quectel modem, is there any type of boost associated with that or anything else? Um, no, so basically the way we pair that is we, we always have the Quectel modem, and then we, well, depends on where it's at, but a lot of times we'll add a signal booster to that. Was that the question? Yeah, so we'll add like a cell fi booster, and that'll get us usually the DBMs, you know, in some of the more difficult spots with that. Um, uh, active. Sure. Any other questions? Yep. Is there any part of this that is open source for us the community to benefit? Yeah, so that um, I addressed a little bit. Um, we plan on doing that, right? So w our focus has been um, really getting it to a point where it's stable and it can be um, scaled pretty well. And now that it's in a pretty good spot, um, we're going to start to build out what we consider like a kit, you know, with the instructions on how to build the kit. And then people can go through and customize it to their specific need. But yeah, the whole purpose of this is is, is to improve community outcomes uh, in the rural communities. Our interest is not um, uh, money for this. We don't make a lot of money on this. Our mainline business is the, the profit maker. This is just to help, literally help the community and solve some of the problems and challenges that we've seen in the rural communities for a very long period of time. Do you? Where do you work? Oh, well, I don't want to exactly, but. Okay, yeah, so. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, and if they're interested, I'm happy to talk to them because the, the kit, it, it, it's essentially a deployable kit, you know, so if, if they have a need, please reach out and we'll be happy to, to get them a kit. So, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. 
relationship with Quectel. Yes, we do. Oh, no, no. We, um, they sent us, uh, so we have development kits in our lab. And actually, uh, Alan Jude um, and, and uh, Clara were, were actually working on that um, to build that driver. So um, yeah, we have, we have all the gear for that in the lab. Yeah, they're good. They're good. They're um, Quectel and CR Wireless are, are kind of the top tier ones. There's some other ones, but Quectel actually tends to have some really good um, connectivity options for their modems. Yeah, if you look at like their AF25s and some of those, they're fine. They're they're good out of the box. This one's fine out of the box. It's the newer ones, like the the ones that run 5G NR high frequency stuff, you know, um, high bandwidth 5G stuff. You, you may not see really good support with that, but, you know, I mean, I know Clara, they develop drivers for that. So that's a great, um, you know, there's, if, if there's a need, um, it can certainly be solved. Uh, what's the question, I'm sorry? Oh, so uh, yeah, so we use um, standard PPP for that. We just that we haven't, yeah, we haven't moved in that. Um, that we want to use a QMI or an MBIM, you know, stack in there, but it, the MBIM and QMI ports have not been done for FreeBSD. So we would need that functionality to do some of these things. All right, we're good. Thank you.